Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5 verse 18. Today we're diving into one of the most debated topics within Christian circles. What does the Bible really say about drinking alcohol? From Jesus turning water into wine to the warnings against drunkenness, the scriptures offer a complex view on this issue. Is it a sin to enjoy a glass of wine? How do we reconcile the freedom to drink with the call to live a holy life? In the Bible, the perspective on alcohol shifts between the Old and New Testaments, offering a nuanced view that reflects the different contexts and messages of these scriptures. In the Old Testament, alcohol appears in various contexts, both positive and negative. For instance, Psalm 104 verses 14 to 15 celebrates wine as a gift from God that gladdens the heart of man. Yet, there are also stern warnings about the dangers of excessive drinking, as seen in Proverbs 20 verse 1, which states, Wine is a mocker and beer brawler, whoever is led astray by them is not wise. Moving to the New Testament, the narrative evolves. Jesus' first miracle at the wedding in Cana, where he turned water into wine, John 2 verses 1 to 11, is often cited to suggest a more lenient view on alcohol. This act was not just a miraculous sign, but also a culturally significant gesture, as wine was an essential part of Jewish celebrations. However, the New Testament also underscores the importance of moderation and self-control. Ephesians 5 verse 18 cautions against drunkenness, urging believers to be filled with the Spirit instead. The Apostle Paul provides practical guidance in his letters, advising Timothy to use a little wine for his stomach ailments, 1 Timothy 5 verse 23, while also stressing that church leaders should not be given to much wine, 1 Timothy 3 verse 3, Titus 1 verse 7. This balance reflects a broader principle in Christianity, enjoying God's gifts responsibly while avoiding excess that leads to moral and spiritual compromise. One of the most intriguing and often debated events in the New Testament is Jesus' first miracle at the wedding in Cana, where he turned water into wine. This miraculous act, recorded in John 2 verses 1 to 11, has sparked numerous discussions about the biblical stance on alcohol consumption. On the surface, this miracle appears to endorse the consumption of alcohol, as Jesus himself provided wine for the celebration. To understand this event fully, it's crucial to consider the cultural and symbolic significance of wine in Jewish traditions. Wine was a staple in ancient Jewish life, used in religious ceremonies and social gatherings. It symbolized joy, blessing, and abundance. By transforming water into wine, Jesus wasn't just supplying a beverage, he was making a profound statement about his mission and the new covenant he was establishing. The quality of the wine, described as superior to what had been served earlier, further emphasizes the transformation Jesus brings. However, this narrative also highlights the importance of moderation. While Jesus provided wine, the context was a wedding feast, a controlled environment of celebration rather than excess. This miracle, therefore, does not advocate for unrestrained drinking but rather acknowledges the appropriate use of wine in a joyous and sacred context. Moreover, the miracle at Cana aligns with other New Testament teachings that advocate for responsible and moderate drinking. It shows that alcohol, in and of itself, is not condemned, but its use should be guided by wisdom and self-control. The act of Jesus turning water into wine serves as a reminder of the balance between enjoying life's blessings and maintaining spiritual discipline. The Bible contains numerous verses that mention alcohol, presenting a spectrum of perspectives that reflect different contexts and teachings. These verses range from outright warnings to acknowledgments of alcohol's role in social and religious life. For example, in Proverbs 20 verse 1, we read, Wine is a mocker and beer brawler, whoever is led astray by them is not wise. This verse clearly cautions against the dangers of excessive drinking, emphasizing the potential for alcohol to lead one astray and cause harm. In contrast, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 7 encourages enjoyment of wine in moderation, Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. This passage highlights a more positive view, suggesting that enjoying wine is part of living a joyful and blessed life under God's provision. 
Similarly, Psalm 104 verses 14 to 15 praises God for providing wine that gladdens human hearts, indicating that alcohol, when used appropriately, can be a source of joy. The New Testament also provides very perspectives. Ephesians 5 verse 18 offers a strong warning, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. This verse draws a clear line between responsible drinking and the loss of control associated with drunkenness, urging believers to seek spiritual fulfillment over physical indulgence. Paul's advice to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5 verse 23, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses, shows a practical and medicinal use of alcohol, reflecting an understanding of its benefits when used wisely. Yet, Paul's qualifications for church leaders in 1 Timothy 3 verse 8 include not being addicted to much wine, underscoring the importance of temperance. Is drinking alcohol a sin? This question has sparked considerable debate among Christians, with interpretations of biblical texts leading to diverse and often opposing views. To navigate this complex issue, it's essential to explore the nuances of Scripture and the historical and cultural contexts in which these texts were written. The Bible does not explicitly state that drinking alcohol is a sin. Instead, it provides a range of teachings that highlight the potential dangers and appropriate uses of alcohol. For example, Proverbs 23 verses 29 to 35 paints a vivid picture of the consequences of excessive drinking. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. This passage warns against the destructive path of overindulgence, emphasizing the physical and emotional toll of drunkenness. The early Christian church grappled with similar questions about the appropriateness of alcohol consumption. The Didache, an early Christian treatise, advises believers to abstain from wine-bibbing and drunkenness, reflecting an early emphasis on temperance. However, this did not translate into a blanket prohibition of alcohol. Instead, early Christians were encouraged to exercise moderation and self-control. Cultural context plays a crucial role in understanding biblical teachings on alcohol. In ancient times, wine was a common beverage, often safer to drink than water due to its fermentation process, which killed harmful bacteria. It was also a significant part of religious rituals and social customs. Therefore, biblical references to wine and alcohol must be seen within this historical framework, where moderate consumption was a normal part of daily life. The question of whether drinking alcohol is a sin also intersects with broader theological and ethical considerations. For instance, the principle of Christian liberty, as outlined in passages like 1 Corinthians 10 verses 23 to 31, suggests that believers have the freedom to make personal choices about such matters. Paul writes, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. This principle implies that while drinking alcohol may not be inherently sinful, believers should consider whether it is beneficial and constructive in their lives and communities. Furthermore, the Bible emphasizes the importance of not causing others to stumble in their faith. In Romans 14 verse 21, Paul states, It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. This principle calls for sensitivity and responsibility towards fellow believers who may struggle with alcohol or have strong convictions against its use. The social and personal consequences of alcohol consumption cannot be overlooked. Drunkenness is often linked to various forms of moral and social decay including addiction, violence, and broken relationships. These outcomes align with biblical warnings against excessive drinking and the loss of self-control. Thus, the Bible's cautionary stance on drunkenness is not merely about the act itself, but about its broader implications for individuals and communities. On the other hand, the enjoyment of wine in moderation is depicted as part of a joyful and grateful life in several biblical passages. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 7 encourages, Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. This verse reflects an understanding that God's blessings, including the fruits of the earth, are meant to be enjoyed responsibly. The interpretation of these texts has led to varied practices among Christian denominations. 
Some, like the Methodist and Baptist traditions, have historically advocated for total abstinence from alcohol, influenced by the temperance movement and concerns about the negative effects of alcohol. Others, such as the Catholic and Orthodox churches, allow for moderate consumption, particularly in sacramental contexts where wine is used in the Eucharist. The debate over alcohol also touches on modern issues such as addiction and public health. The Bible's emphasis on self-control, wisdom, and the avoidance of excess can inform contemporary discussions about responsible drinking and the societal impact of alcohol abuse. Christians are called to exercise discernment, balancing their freedom with their responsibility to themselves, others, and God. Ultimately, the question of whether drinking alcohol is a sin cannot be answered with a simple yes or no. It requires a thoughtful examination of biblical teachings, cultural contexts, and personal convictions. The Bible's multifaceted approach to alcohol encourages believers to navigate this issue with wisdom, self-control, and a deep sense of responsibility towards their faith and community. Concept of Christian liberty, which suggests that believers have the freedom to make personal choices in areas not explicitly addressed by Scripture. However, this liberty is not without its boundaries, especially when it comes to behaviors that can potentially lead to sin or harm others. The concept of Christian liberty is rooted in the teachings of the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 10 verses 23 to 24, he writes, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. This passage highlights the principle that, while Christians may have the freedom to engage in certain behaviors, not all behaviors are beneficial or edifying. This is particularly relevant to the consumption of alcohol, which, although not forbidden by scripture, must be approached with wisdom and consideration for its potential impacts. Paul's discussion of liberty extends to his treatment of disputable matters in Romans 14. Here, he addresses differences in personal convictions among believers, urging them to respect one another's choices while avoiding actions that could cause others to stumble in their faith. Romans 14 verse 21 specifically states, It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. This underscores the responsibility Christians have to consider the effects of their actions on the faith and well-being of others. The balance between freedom and responsibility is further complicated by cultural and historical contexts. In many ancient cultures, including the Jewish context of the Bible, wine was a common and accepted part of daily life and religious rituals. This cultural backdrop influences how biblical references to alcohol are understood. In contrast, Modern societies often grapple with the consequences of alcohol abuse, including addiction, health issues, and social problems. These contemporary challenges necessitate a careful and contextually aware approach to alcohol consumption. For many Christians, the idea of liberty in Christ is liberating, offering a release from legalistic constraints and a call to live by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 13 emphasizes this freedom, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather, serve one another humbly in love. This verse encapsulates the delicate balance between enjoying the freedoms granted by faith and exercising those freedoms in a manner that promotes love, service, and self-discipline. However, the practical application of this principle can be controversial. Some argue that Christian liberty allows for moderate alcohol consumption as long as it does not lead to drunkenness or cause others to stumble. They point to Jesus' example at the wedding in Cana, John 2 verses 1 to 11, and Paul's advice to Timothy, 1 Timothy 5 verse 23, as evidence that moderate drinking is acceptable. This perspective views alcohol as a gift from God that can be enjoyed responsibly, similar to other aspects of creation. On the other hand, some Christian communities advocate for total abstinence from alcohol, citing the potential risks and the biblical warnings against drunkenness. They argue that the best way to avoid the pitfalls of alcohol abuse is to abstain entirely. This stance is often influenced by the temperance movement and the desire to set a positive example within the church and society. For these Christians, abstinence is seen as a way to exercise self-control and avoid any appearance of impropriety. The tension between these views is evident in various denominational teachings and practices. For instance, 
Denominations like the Southern Baptists and Methodists traditionally emphasize abstinence, while others, like the Catholic and Orthodox churches, permit moderate consumption, especially in liturgical settings. This diversity reflects the broader debate within Christianity about how to apply biblical principles to contemporary issues. The role of personal conviction is crucial in this discussion. Romans 14 verses 5 to 6 advises, one person considers one day more sacred than another, another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God, and whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. This passage encourages believers to honor their personal convictions while respecting the differing views of others. It acknowledges that individual conscience plays a significant role in determining how to exercise Christian liberty. In practice, this means that Christians are called to make informed and prayerful decisions about alcohol consumption, considering both their own spiritual well-being and the potential impact on their community. This requires a nuanced understanding of scripture, cultural awareness, and a commitment to living out the principles of love and self-control. The social implications of alcohol consumption also warrant careful consideration. Alcohol abuse can have devastating effects on individuals, families, and communities. It can lead to addiction, health problems, and social issues such as violence and broken relationships. The Bible's warnings against drunkenness are not merely about personal morality but also about the broader social consequences of losing control. Ephesians 5 verse 18 cautions, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. This verse highlights the contrast between the destructive effects of excessive drinking and the positive influence of the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, Christians are called to be mindful of their witness to the world. 1 Peter 2 verse 12 advises, live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This call to live exemplary lives includes being cautious about behaviors that could be misinterpreted or that could undermine the credibility of the Christian witness. In societies where alcohol abuse is prevalent, choosing to abstain or to drink responsibly can serve as a powerful testimony of self-control and integrity. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, as outlined in Galatians 5 verses 22-23, and is crucial for maintaining a disciplined and God-centered life. The lack of self-control associated with excessive drinking can undermine one's ability to live out this essential Christian virtue. Proverbs 25 verse 28 poignantly states, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. This vivid imagery illustrates how a lack of self-control can leave one vulnerable to various spiritual and moral dangers. Addiction, one of the gravest risks associated with alcohol, represents a profound spiritual bondage. Jesus taught about the importance of serving only one master, Matthew 6 verse 24, and addiction can become a form of idolatry, where alcohol becomes a master over one's life. This idolatry not only affects the individual's relationship with God, but can also disrupt relationships within the faith community. Romans 6 verse 16 warns, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? This stark warning highlights the spiritual slavery that addiction can create, pulling individuals away from their commitment to righteousness and towards a path of spiritual decay. Moreover, alcohol can impair one's spiritual discernment and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5 verse 18 contrasts being filled with wine with being filled with the Spirit, suggesting that the former can impede the latter. When one's mind and spirit are clouded by alcohol, it becomes more challenging to hear and respond to God's guidance. This impaired discernment can lead to poor decision-making and a weakened ability to resist temptation and sin. The call to holiness, a recurring theme throughout the Bible, also intersects with the discussion on alcohol. 1 Peter 1 verses 15 to 16 exhorts believers, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. This call to holiness involves setting oneself apart from behaviors and practices that can defile or corrupt. 
While the Bible does not explicitly prohibit alcohol, it emphasizes the importance of maintaining purity and avoiding anything that can lead to moral compromise. Alcohol, particularly when consumed in excess, can be a stumbling block to this pursuit of holiness. The influence of alcohol on one's witness to others is another critical consideration. Christians are called to be ambassadors of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, representing his values and character to the world. The way believers handle alcohol can significantly impact their testimony. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22 advises, abstain from every form of evil, which includes avoiding behaviors that could lead others to question the sincerity and integrity of one's faith. In a society where alcohol abuse is rampant, demonstrating responsible or abstinent behavior can serve as a powerful witness to the transformative power of the gospel. The communal aspect of faith further amplifies the importance of this issue. As members of the body of Christ, believers are interconnected, and their actions can affect the broader community. Paul addresses this interconnectedness in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 26, If one part suffers, every part suffers with it, if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. When a member of the community struggles with alcohol, it can create ripples of pain and disruption throughout the church. Conversely, when believers exercise self-control and support one another in avoiding the pitfalls of alcohol, it strengthens the entire community. Alcohol's role in social interactions within the faith community also deserves attention. While social drinking can be a means of fellowship and celebration, it can also lead to exclusion and judgment if not handled carefully. Romans 14 verses 13 to 21 emphasizes the importance of not causing others to stumble, particularly in matters of personal conviction. This passage advises believers to prioritize love and edification over exercising personal freedoms in ways that could harm others. In practice, this means being mindful of those who may have a history of addiction or strong convictions against alcohol and choosing to abstain or limit consumption out of respect and love for them. Additionally, alcohol can affect one's ability to engage in spiritual disciplines such as prayer, Bible study, and worship. These practices require a clear mind and a focused spirit, conditions that are compromised by excessive drinking. 1 Peter for verse 7 states, The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. This verse underscores the importance of sobriety in maintaining a vibrant and effective prayer life, which is foundational to one's spiritual health and growth. Alcohol's potential to lead to other sins is another significant concern. Drunkenness can open the door to a range of behaviors that are inconsistent with Christian ethics, such as sexual immorality, violence, and dishonesty. Proverbs 23 verses 31 to 33 warns, Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights, and your mind will imagine confusing things. This passage highlights the deceptive nature of alcohol, which can appear enticing but ultimately leads to harmful consequences. The financial impact of alcohol consumption is another practical consideration. Money spent on alcohol can divert resources from more important uses, such as providing for one's family, supporting the church, or helping those in need. Proverbs 21 verse 17 cautions, Whoever loves pleasure will become poor, whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be rich. This warning speaks to the broader principle of stewardship, urging believers to use their resources wisely and in ways that honor God. In summary, the impact of alcohol on spiritual life is multifaceted, encompassing issues of self-control, addiction, discernment, holiness, witness, community, spiritual discipline, the potential for leading to other sins, and financial stewardship. The Bible's teachings on these matters call for a careful and conscientious approach to alcohol, one that prioritizes spiritual health and the well-being of the faith community. Considering the balance of biblical teachings, the call to holiness, self-control, and the impact on our witness and community, the responsible choice is to either abstain from alcohol or consume it in strict moderation. This approach ensures that we avoid the pitfalls of addiction, maintain our spiritual discernment, uphold our Christian testimony, and protect the well-being of those around us. Thank you for watching. If you found this video insightful, please like, comment, and subscribe for more content. God bless us all.